The broadcast is now starting. All attendees. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm going to present today on valuation of SMSF um, non-listed assets. And um, we're going to discuss various issues uh, relating to uh, the the uh, valuation criteria which the administrators and trustees are using. Uh, we're going to talk about how to value some of these assets and uh, we're going to talk about what sorts of assets a self-managed super fund can have which are non-listed. When I say non-listed, I mean by non-listed in a stock exchange. So if um, uh, a fund has certain shares which are listed in the stock exchange, the valuation is on 30th of June is pretty easy. Um, and those of you who are using online SMSF Odin are aware that we actually feed in those valuations. Now, if we feed in only the Australian Stock Exchange, um, it's possible that a super fund could own assets in the New York Stock Exchange or any other recognized stock exchange in the world. But we don't feed in those values. But um, uh, I'm assuming that it's very easy because uh, an auditor or an administrator can very quickly get the uh, valuation on 30th of June of that uh, particular asset. Now, um, uh, why it is important uh, for 30th June 2017 is because of the CGT relief, which is uh, available and it's a uh, opt-in. Um, uh, the problem with opt-in is that if once it's uh, chosen, it is irrevocable. That means that uh, if you have decided you're going to reset the cost base of an asset, then that would be the market value of your asset. That would be the new cost base of your asset. And any future gain on that asset will be only taxable and any gain up to that point will not be taxable. Now, um, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about CGT relief and those who have missed our CGT relief uh, 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 webinars, uh, you know, uh, they will be uploaded. We have forwarded it to um, uh, the uh, Financial Planning Association and they are in the a process of um, uh, allocating the CPD hours and once we've got those um, clearances from them we will be uploading them on our on our um, website now uh, valuation of assets is also very important as far as uh, balance transfer cap calculations are concerned as you know that from 1st of July 2017 there is a limit on how much uh, can move from accumulation account to retirement phase and that figure at the moment stands at 1.6 million which is to be increased by 100,000 every year and um, that that means that it will be uh, quite some time that we see an increase from 1.6 million to a higher figure of 1.7 million so um, the balance transfer cap a figure of 1.6 million depends on total superannuation balance and this is a new term and I'm going to discuss a little bit about that that uh, how is total superannuation interest of a member calculated and uh, and that uh, is an underlying factor of determining the balance transfer cap and which is used to commence a pension so we're going to discuss all those issues and um, uh, it's uh, uh, it's very important that uh, that trustees are aware uh, if they own properties which are not listed shares uh, that they value it correctly because uh, uh, the tax office has mentioned in several of their announcements that they will be looking at what valuations trustees have been using in the past and how much they are going to look at it for 30th June uh, purposes, 30th June pension purposes, especially when uh, trustees are uh, opting in for the CGT relief. Um, now, uh, one should understand that, uh, you know, we're talking about uh, self-managed super funds. So uh, all those uh, funds which are uh, outside the ambit of self-managed super funds, they have to be brought in as well because total superannuation balance also includes 
superannuation interests which are outside of self managed super fund and that makes the life of an accountant very complicated and i'm going to discuss uh, about that a bit later now before i proceed um, uh, just uh, about some housekeeping in your panel you will see uh, that there is a phone number which is provided so if you can't hear me well uh, you need to ring that number and uh, this is the best i can do as far as audio is concerned we have a, um, a very nice connection here and there's nothing else i can do and i'm using a quite a sophisticated headgear right now um, uh, those who joined me later you will notice in your panel there are five handouts um, i welcome you to download them and i'm going to talk about them a little bit later but um, uh, if you you will be using them if you're an administrator or a trustee or if you're an auditor you'll be needing these kind of declarations from the trustee so i recommend that you download them now if you want a copy of the presentation uh, very soon i'm going to give you an email id you can send your request there and uh, we will send it out to you as well now uh, i'm sure you'll have some questions and in your panel you will see that there is a question box i welcome you to um, ask any questions but i will not be able to answer any questions till the end of the presentation and we'll will uh, you know try and answer all your questions uh, in the time uh, which i have allocated i think i should be finished in an hour or some time uh, including the question time so those who want to hang out till the end you know if you don't have a question maybe somebody else has a question which you did not think think about so you can hang out after after the presentation i'm going to read out every question and then try and answer them to the best of my ability right so um, let's uh, let's look at um, uh, the issues here and uh, why do we have to value an asset we're looking at uh, sis regulation 8.02b which says asset must be valued at market value and market value is defined by section 101 of the act in relation to the asset it means the amount of a willing buyer of an asset would reasonably be expected to pay to acquire the asset from a willing seller so what we are talking about is a total uh, 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 independent valuation in a situation where if the asset is sold at market uh, without any undue pressure like it's it's not sold as an urgent sale now um, uh, i've also quoted some uh, accounting standards especially ASB uh, 1056, which is for superannuation entities, and the ASB 13, which is the fair value measurements. Now, at this point of time, I just want you to uh, think of two issues, which is the disposal cost and tax to be paid on disposal. Now, uh, assuming there is uh, accumulation in a pension account in a fund, and the fund owns a property. uh there would be some disposal cost because you will employ an agent to sell the property so it's possible that uh, if a property is worth a million dollars a 2% are paid to uh, a real estate agent say $20000 and then if you have an accumulation account in the fund and maybe the accumulation account could be say 20% it's possible that there is a gain in that property at the at the market value if it is sold and that gain is taxable so you're not ending up with the with the money the full 1 million for which the property would be sold you will pay a real estate agent you will probably pay a solicitor and you will pay tax so um, when you are valuing assets you must a trustee and an administrator must consider that what the Uh, the trustees or what the members are going to receive after the disposal of that asset so tax can be a big factor if um, you have a large amount of accumulation uh, balances and if there is a large amount of capital gain uh, at the time of sale of the asset so this is something uh, you should uh, really consider uh, you know at the time of uh, finalizing your set of accounts now um what happens uh, in practical uh, uh, in practical in practicality is that um you uh, complete the set of accounts 
and uh, on 30th of June, uh, if you're using a software uh, which has the 30th June prizes like BGL 360 or BGL Simple Fund or Class Super, uh, it will uh, uh, understand that the fund has so many uh, uh, shares of such and such entity. It will up the uh, or down the uh, the closing sh value of that asset. Uh, the problem is that if it is not a listed asset, then these softwares will require some sort of an input into the software so that we know the real market value. Now, if there is a gain or loss, that according to SIS regulation 5.03, now I'm talking about the unrealized gain, the growth in the uh, asset value or the reduction in the asset value, uh, regulation 5.03 talks about that the trustee uh, must give the investment return or distribute the investment return by a credit or a debit to the member balance in a way that is fair and reasonable between all the members of the fund and the various kinds of benefits of each member of the fund. Now, uh, it's very loosely defined uh, fair and reasonable because I think that if there is husband and wife and um, if the husband in the fund, husband and wife in the fund, and if the husband is closer to retirement phase, I think it will be very fair that most of the gain goes to uh, the member who is going to go into retirement first. And I think it is reasonable if uh, the spouse, the wife does not object to that allocation of uh, unrealized income to the husband. So I guess you will meet the criteria of uh, fair and reasonable. Now, uh, those uh, of you who are auditors, uh, uh, when you're auditing a fund, I'm not sure how many of you actually check how much unrealized gain is being credited to one particular member because most of the softwares, what they do is they add up all the income. So they add up the realized gain, which is a capital gain, and they add up all the income, uh, not the contributions because contributions get directly credited to the member account, but they add up all the income, the total all that income, including the unrealized gain, and then uh, they sometimes look at uh, the opening balance of each member or the closing balance of each member or sometimes they take an average to check whether the correct amount has been allocated. Now most softwares allow uh, override of this um, average balances and um, some softwares will even credit income according to daily balance method. So if there is a contribution by a member uh, during the year, uh, they would be allocated a higher amount and they would not only consider the opening balance, but they would consider the number of days the new contributions have remained in the fund. And those softwares are also programmed in such a manner that if there is a huge pension payment, the uh, the reduction in the allocation is given because if the pension balance is reduced by a significant amount, then obviously they will be credited with less income for the whole year. Now, uh, we should not confuse ourselves with allocation of expenses because allocation of expenses happen in a different way altogether. So here we are concerned with only uh, uh, with the allocation of income to the various members. Now, uh, regulations talk about allocation of expenses and there's a ruling about it as well on which uh, expenses can be allocated because there are certain expenses which cannot be allocated to a pension fund and then we're going in the area of uh, exempt current pension income deductions and you know there are certain expenses which can uh, you know be deducted fully but we're talking about uh, a fund where uh, we have a mixed number of uh, uh, members that some are in pension and some are in accumulation if your fund has only uh, accumulating members or only pension members then i guess it in the olden days it didn't matter much 
but now it could matter because it is quite possible that one of the member uh, is um, very close to 1.6 million and is thinking of contributing more money so more uh, amount will be credited to the balance transfer cap amount whereas the other member could also be on pension but maybe the balances are to 1 million so you will be or the trustees or the accountants would be quite um, you know um, aggressive in how they will be uh, allocating the income they will be quite keen to allocate ink more of the income to a member who is uh, on 1 million instead of the one who is closer to 1.6 million so as far as uh, the audit is concerned i have not seen uh, anywhere in the contravention report where we talk about um, you know whether the allocation was uh, unreasonable or not although i must warn the auditors that the audit report contains uh, sis regulation 5.03 so um, it is something which you comment on it is something which you look at but um, a contravention of 5.03 uh, would be very very rare now uh, what i've been doing while i was getting uh, prepared for this presentation is to keep a very close eye and ears towards what the tax office is saying about valuations and um, they've been very vocal they've been uh, especially the deputy commissioner for superannuation james o halloran and um, if you look at some of the comments he's been making and they've been trying to trying to influence the um, the accountants and the trustees to go for independent valuation like in the statement says an independent professional valuation will be the best evidence to support uh, the value attributed although the legislation which we are going to talk about very soon does not force the trustees to seek independent professional valuation so the ato favors an independent professional valuation although the legislation does not support that independent professional valuation uh, but he also says that uh, trustees can also rely on data such as valuation by real estate agent comparable sales data property valuation website data or rates notice notices as objective evidence to support the real property valuations so um, as long as there is some supportive data uh, where uh, the trustees uh, you know rely on uh, i guess that needs to be put forward to the auditor so that the auditor is convinced that those valuations are fair and reasonable now if you look at the handouts which i have um, uploaded uh, in the handout panel uh, in the panel in the handout area um, usually an auditor would like a market value declaration by the trustees and if you open that word document you will see that there is space that uh, the trustee must declare that uh, and and disclose to the uh, auditor on how he uh, reached to the conclusion that the property is valued at a certain value so it's not only about uh, determining or deciding that's the value i want there should be some basis of uh, reaching to that conclusion so uh, either there should be a letter from the real estate agent or the trustee should uh, if there is a unit uh, the, you know in a block of uh, flats so let's say there are 20 flats if there have been some recent sales you know that data is quite um, openly available um, uh, in some property valuation websites um, you know or there's some sort of a support uh, which the trustees have now uh, the other thing uh, which uh, you should also look at is uh, the uh, reasonable reflection uh, of what uh, the deputy commissioner is talking about because uh, he also talks about that there would be a certain range that uh, the property could be valued at because since the value is not uh, since the property is not being sold the property um, uh, will have a range from minimum and maximum 
and um, uh, what uh, what the commissioner was the deputy commissioner is worried about that we cannot use two values for every property we have to use one value and this is where the problem is for 30th june 2017 because uh, what he's warning is that uh, the one purpose could be is to commence a pension and then you will be encouraged to use uh, a lower valuation because you want more money to go into the pension account uh, but uh, uh, you could be also influenced to use a higher figure uh, because then you can claim the CGT relief so if you think the value should be higher so what what basically we are talking about is a double-edged sword that if you use a higher valuation then less tax will be uh, will be if you claim the cgt relief less tax will be payable when the properties are ultimately sold so let's say uh, on 30th of june if we bought a property for 1 million uh, we used uh, a valuation of 1.5 million so when the property is sold for say 2 million the gain is 500000 but you will be uh, you will be encouraged to use 1.6 because you're still under the uh, if that is the only asset of the fund you'll be because there is a gap between the value of the property and the balance transfer cap amount so you'll be encouraged to use not 1.5 million but 1.6 million because you're still under the cap because when ultimately the property is sold the the capital gain to be paid is only 400 and not 500 because the real value could be 1.5 but because you want a higher figure then then uh, you know uh, uh, the cgt uh, uh, option or the choice which you will be making uh, would be based on a figure which will uh, which will try to potentially maximize the balance transfer cap amount now some funds have five six million per member and in those cases you know uh, they would be encouraged to use a lower amount the reason they want to use a lower amount is because they want to get the maximum in inside the 1.6 million and there could be some uh, adjustments to the market values uh, so that a uh, higher income is included higher income uh, uh, from those assets as included as exempt income so there could be um, uh, a big issue uh, as far as uh, the valuation is concerned but as long as you understand a higher valuation will suit those people who want to max out the balance transfer cap amount now this makes the job of the uh, uh, auditor very very difficult and i've been recommending auditors to lodge contravention reports whenever they see a property in a self-managed super fund and uh, the contravention report and the qualification in the audit report should be very simple to say that i'm not a qualified um, qualified uh, uh, valuer and um, uh, a trustee has made a declaration and i'm not confident whether that value is correct because i'm not qualified to make that judgment so um, i'll give you an example there was a fund which i looked at very recently it had a property uh, purchased for 800000 in 2007 and uh, this property uh, was very close to Auburn uh, uh, train station and was a residential house. Now, um, uh, I tried to uh, look at the market value and uh, there were instances where similar houses were sold a couple of years back for 1.2 million and 1.3 million. And there was one off uh, sale of about four million and uh, of a property which was only four doors away from this property so all the houses was uh, were sold for 1.2 million but this uh, four million dollar uh, sale stuck out and after making uh, further investigations i i found out that that area has been rezoned for 
a high-rise development and this property which the trustee was claiming to be close to 1.2 million if actually sold in the market uh, would be sold for 4 million or thereabouts and if you remember the definition in section 10 it talks about a willing seller and a willing buyer so um, if you were presented uh, with the set of accounts with 1.2 million with a purchase four or five years back for 800,000 as an auditor you would be quite satisfied by looking at the declaration and you would say that my job is done as long as I have a declaration and sometimes the trustees can extend and even provide you with a letter from a real estate agent a friendly real estate agent um, that could influence your decision as an auditor but uh, the factual information uh, the factual facts uh, about the real market value could be altogether something else so uh, uh, it calls for uh, a qualification in the audit report and it calls for uh, contravention uh, for that fund and I know it could be very difficult because if you are an auditor and if all your clients have uh, property in the fund you will be lodging a lot of contraventions but I leave that uh, bit to you whether that would be correct uh, to do or not. Now, why is uh, valuation uh, important? First is we have to prepare financial accounts on 30th of June, so we need some sort of a figure. Sometimes what is happening is that um, uh, super fund trustees are buying assets from the members and related parties, and they could be collectibles which you can't do anymore but it could be business real property which is exempted on section 66 of the act that is what you can buy from a related party um, so uh, the other exemption lies to asx listed shares so that's fine uh, the market value can be determined very easily but there is a little bit of uh, uh, naughtiness which is still possible because uh, these transfers are done um, uh, off in off market and the dates can be played around so uh, trustees can basically look at two uh, dividend dates and see I can pick any date between uh, the date when the last dividend paid was paid and when the dividend was paid now to the super fund when the asset was transferred so off market transfers um, can be a little bit and they tried to change it as well i think there was an inquiry about whether self-managed super funds are running properly some years back and they uh, they talked about that off-market transfers should be disallowed so that means that the only way you could sell shares to your super fund was via a broker uh, but another thing which you can sell to your super fund is uh, business uh, use property and um, that's again exempted and uh, some residential properties which are owned via a trust so if you have um, a, a, a fixed unit trust and the fixed unit trust owns a residential properties it is possible that the units which you own in that fixed unit trust and there are certain conditions which you have to meet and i'm going to talk about that uh, in a later slide so those units could also be transferred to the super fund so but I'm going to talk about that uh, let's not confuse ourselves with the topic here on how you know fixed unit trust units are actually sold so it's it's it is quite possible to sell residential properties to your super fund as long as it is uh, structured properly so um, uh, we have to be very careful uh, on how much we invest in uh, in-house assets by, and we should not intentionally invest in in-house assets but there's a certain percentage and that percentage is 5% so it's possible that the value of that asset may go up and if it if it goes up section 82 tells us that we got to fix that percentage in the next 12 months and how we do that is again listed in section 82 that is by disinvesting or by making more contributions in the fund but another reason why valuation is very important is because uh, when uh, five when regulation 5.03 credits the uh, pension account of the member 
the 30th June or the 1st of July balance of that member determines what the minimum amount has to be withdrawn the following year. So it can be uh, quite tricky, you know, because if the valuation is low, then the minimum amount uh, gets reduced in future years. So it is also very important for uh, auditors to have a look at that. Now, um, if you're commencing a pension, then we have discussed that transfer balance cap is an important amount and we have discussed that a CGT relief is a, a real issue here. Now, um, uh, determining the market value of assets, which is supporting the retirement phase of the member and the uh, pension phase of uh, and the accumulation phase of the member uh, is uh, is become a real uh, challenge now because now we are going into a new era where we are not only talking about the balances which a member has in a self-managed super fund we're talking about the balances which a member have in all superannuation funds so the new concept we are going to talk about is the total superannuation balance and it's defined in the uh, new um, TLA 81 and it talks about uh, a total superannuation balance being the sum of uh, all the accumulation phases and the adjusted balance of all the transfer balance accounts and it could be in one fund or it could be in several funds so it's possible that your clients may have a self-managed super fund and may even have a AMP uh, fund which could be either on pension or in accumulation so we're talking about all those monies plus any rolled over money plus uh, any money sitting in all those uh, accounts which are outside uh, the ambit and it's quite possible that if you're an accountant your client has never told you that he has money in super and you should be uh, asking these questions because uh, those who have um, you know left any government uh, or defined benefit plans all those monies would also be counted in the total superannuation balance now the reason why total superannuation balance is going to be an important figure because um, the future non-concessional contributions are based on how much money you already have in super and if you already have 1.6 million uh, in super that is a total superannuation balance you are no longer allowed to make any non-concessional contributions and there are rules uh, for bring forward rule as well whether your balance is 1.4 million 1.5 million in the prior years and whether you can bring forward the next two years or only one year so the only the amount which is the cap amount that is uh, the amount of total superannuation balance and the 1.6 million the balance transfer cap amount can also be can only be contributed in non-concessional contributions for an example if your total superannuation balance was uh, 1.5 million and 50000 the cap is only 50000 so although you can contribute $100000 you are not allowed to contribute $100000 which is your non-concessional contribution cap amount, you can contribute only up to the balance transfer cap amount, which is 1.6 million. So the maximum you can contribute is 50,000. Now, uh, the TLA 81 also introduces us with catch-up contributions. That is uh, basically for those people who have not been able to contribute the full 25,000 concessional contribution cap amount and if their balances are less than 500,000 uh, if their total superannuation balances are less than 500,000 they are able to contribute the catch-up contributions in future years but we shouldn't be talking about that at this point of time because this extra concessional contribution is only available from 1st of July 2019 and I will not be surprised if the government doesn't change these rules uh, from now till 1st of July 2019. Now, uh, another reason why total superannuation balance is very, very important is because it's not only for those members who are already in retirement phase, but it is also for those members who will be in retirement phase in future. 
so somebody like me i'm 54 so i'm waiting for the next five years at 59 that is my preservation age i have to watch my balance my total superannuation balance and when i am eligible maybe at 60 and if i'm retired i will probably take a lump sum pay off the home loan and then i look at the balance transfer cap amount at that amount and then commence a retirement of uh, or tax-free retirement or leave the amount in accumulation so total superannuation balance is very important and how do we find out the total superannuation balance that's very easy that's the member balance in the financial statements and how does it get into the financial statements we value the assets and we credit or debit with the unrealized gain or loss and that determines the financial um, accounts income or unrealized income and that determines the credit or debit to the member account and that determines what you're going to insert in the income tax return of the self-managed super fund so the tax office will follow the figure which you insert uh, in the income tax return for each member in the member statements uh, and uh, determine the total superannuation balance of each member now uh, how do value non-listed assets collectibles um, you know if you are selling to a related party we need an independent valuer but if you're selling other assets of the super fund to related parties then valuation is not required but um, you should look at section 109 of the sys act section 109 talks about any transaction uh, by the super fund with a related party must be at arm's length basis so we we must be very very careful and um, i strongly recommend that you use a qualified independent valuer to back up your market valuation although the legislation does not require it but it would be a good idea that if you are selling to your super fund let's say your office or um, uh, or your uh, other assets uh, which you own uh, you you get an independent valuation done by a qualified independent valuer and sell or buy from the super fund uh, as per the independent valuers valuation now um, if the property is sold to an unrelated party then obviously no valuation is required now i have put unrelated parties in red color and the reason i have put in red color is because uh, let's assume a situation where wilson family superannuation fund sells uh, asset to alan wilson and then alan wilson is also a member of the fund and if you check the telephone directory there are about 4000 allen wilsons registered in new south wales so who is an unrelated party so we should look at the part 8 <coughs> part 8 associates definition uncle aunts nieces nephews they're all included so who is an unrelated party and sometimes you will find that assets of the super fund are sold to individuals or to entities and the owner of those entities could be related parties so so the role of um, auditor extends beyond uh, just looking at the contract of sale and checking the name out on who was the purchaser of that asset because if the valuation is not required then it is quite possible that uh, the super fund trustee sells a property of the super fund under market value to actually a related party now uh, there's been talk about two super funds and i have a webinar as well uh in a fortnight um, by the way we will be running webinars on fortnightly basis so you can visit uh, that page as often as you like and register yourself uh, the next webinar is i think on the 6th of november so um 
we must be very uh, uh, vigilant and we should be uh, as an auditor we must make sure that the asset which is sold is uh, really to an unrelated party and to determine whether the valuation was correct or not because if it is sold at a lower value then the super fund ends up paying less cgt tax on that and there are lots of other consequences but when you commence a valuation when you commence a pension or when you calculate the in-house asset whether it has exceeded five percent or not or whether the transitional cgt relief will be applicable whether the fund or whether that asset is eligible or not or when you're calculating the total superannuation balance uh, the legislation requires us or rather the ato guideline uh, um, tells us that we should be using valuation which is based on objective and supportive data now what is objective and supportive data it's basically uh, some fundamentals uh, in that valuation process are undertaken by the trustees that means that some comparative data uh, is available now uh, i also am a real estate agent i did this qualification about 10 or 15 years back and it's for the fun of it i don't sell properties for anybody else um, what what we are taught is that no two houses are the same because the upgrade on each house I mean, we could have two houses looking the same from outside, but it's quite possible that inside the house, there could be marble on one and there could be gyprock on the other. So the valuation could be totally different, although the houses could be sitting right next to each other or across the street. Even across the street is even more dangerous because one could be facing south and one could be facing north and there could be a 10% difference just because of that reason. So because you are not able to identify what the correct market value should be it becomes uh, uh, the objective and the supportive data is very unreliable and because of this unreliability uh, we had the deputy commissioner talking about a range or the value could be from this value to that value so as long as uh, you use a value which is within that range and that range should be very close to that objective and supportive data i guess the trustees have done a good job uh, in uh, in uh, you know having a set of accounts which are fair and reasonable and having member balances which are fair and reasonable because they've credited or debited the account with the unrealized gain as per whatever sub objective and supportive data is available but as far as the auditor's uh, perspective is concerned you know we have to uh, look at who has it's not the uh, it's not who has conducted the valuation and and everybody knows there are two types of valuers there's a there's an independent valuer and then there is an independent friendly valuer and usually independent friendly valuer will value whatever you want them to value so they look at the they look at the purpose of the valuation and if you tell them the purpose of the valuation is to find out the market value uh, which i'm going to put in my financial uh, uh, statements that valuation would be very different if you go to the same valuer and say i'm going to apply for a loan to buy this property because then they would be very conservative because the banks have asked them to be conservative so there could be the same valuer could come up with different figures but if you are an auditor you can uh, request the trustee for an independent valuation and maybe you're not just satisfied with the declaration uh, provided to you by the trustee or you're not satisfied with a letter from the real estate agent so you have to do your own um, you know legwork you need to find out how much uh, the property prices are on that street and it could be very difficult because uh, prices go up and prices go down and we all know that Perth has been going down for 10 or 15 percent in the last couple of years so we don't know uh, what street on Perth or what suburb in Perth is not going down so when you say Perth it's like a big market when you say Sydney Sydney is a big market there's certain um, areas in Sydney which have actually gone down last year 
but there are certain areas in Sydney which have gone up and in the future when everybody is predicting Sydney prices to go down so we're not talking about mean prices we're talking about mean suburb prices and then there are certain suburbs which have certain streets so you cannot say that one street which is could be let's say water facing their prices will probably never go down but a street just behind that their prices could go up and down so it's a it's a very complex um, and it's very difficult to find out the market value and when it is uh, uh, complex and difficult and when that asset is a significant proportion uh, of the total fund value then i guess um, the uh, the auditor should be seeking some sort of uh, assurance from an independent party but then you know that could be unreliable as well and that is why uh, i'm recommending to qualify the audit report so um, if you are an auditor just be careful while you are uh, okaying or while you are issuing your audit report uh, for that fund there was um, uh, a ruling a long time back which requested a valuation once in three years um, I, I that does not apply anymore so the ato guideline uh, is the most recent um, method on how uh, you should value an asset now uh, the handouts which i have provided to you uh, if the 1.6 million uh, has been achieved in retirement phase and if the retiree wants to withdraw a lump sum there is a letter to the trustee and then a trustee minute on how to do that and if you are not planning to withdraw the amount above the 1.6 million balance transfer cap amount and you want to commute the pension to accumulation uh, to comply the balance transfer cap amount i have provided you a request by the member and the minutes on how to do it so these documentation are very important and these documentation uh, should be dated uh, anywhere between 9th of november 2016 and 30th june where the fund is 100 percent segregated fund and if you had an accumulation account that is if you had an unsegregated fund then they should be dated 30th of june 2017. there is a declaration that is a purchase of a business real property from a related prop from a related party and then um, there's another declaration which the trustee can provide to the auditor and the administrator about the market value on 30th june every year and then it talks about the supportive data which he the trustee has gone through and that supporting documents which he should provide to the auditor now if the super fund owns a residential property um, if i was to audit that fund i would seek a declaration from the trustee that it was not leased to a related party and then that related party definition again we have to go to the part eight associate definition now uh, it can be a very difficult thing for some auditors because when you look at the names of the four members and when you uh, have a lease document in front of you it's possible that um, that the that the tenant could be the daughter's father-in-law so you know uh, now if the lease is given to a daughter's father-in-law he's not a part eight associate of that self-managed super fund and if the lease is provided to the father-in-law of your daughter it's quite possible that the daughter could be living in that house so you know feel free to change the declaration which i'm providing in word format so it should say it should, that Although there is no lease, there is no related party actually residing in that property. And sometimes trustees, um, you know, when they want to do naughty stuff, they go to great extent. What they do is they actually hire a, a real estate agent in between. So the real estate agent uh, collects the rent from the daughter, daughter's father-in-law. So sometimes, you know, 
uh, there could be skeletons in the closet. It just depends on how much you want to uh, investigate and uh, how much you want to uncover. Um, in situations where uh, the same firm audits as well, so uh, let's say you have 200 funds, you are a three or a four partner firm, and one of the partner is the accountant of the self-managed super fund, and one of the partner who sits on the other side of the Chinese wall may have nothing to do with accounting is the auditor of the fund. So those kind of situations are going to be looked at first. Um, that's what the tax office is talking about. So they're going to look at the association between the auditor and the accounting firm. And I somehow don't understand how all that works because I've looked at auditors who audit for AMP and AMP has got 10,000 funds or plus and their auditor audits say 1,000 funds and he goes to work every day and he goes to work to AMP. So I don't know how that auditor is actually independent auditor because the only person or the only entity which gives him a job is AMP. So what I've noticed is that uh, the tax office is going in layers. So the first thing was to get rid of those uh, auditors who were preparing accounts as well, the sole practitioners who were preparing accounts and they were uh, auditing the fund as well. So they're trying to get rid of them first and then they will go to a two partner firm situation where one uh, partner is the accountant and one partner is the auditor to ask them to determine how and where the Chinese walls are. And then possibly they'll go to uh, three partner and four partner firms and somewhere in between they'll go to large administrators to prove that if you're looking after say 2000 or 3000 funds how many auditors do you have and do you switch do you have auditor rotation like one auditor uh, let's say you're auditing sorry you're looking after 3000 funds <coughs> and you may have six auditors so each auditor is looking after 500 funds but the auditor A, he's audited, uh, let's say, fund from one to fund 500. Next year, are you asking him to audit fund 501 to 1000? Or is he year in and year out auditing the same funds? So there's, there would be some kind of a rotation uh, which would be introduced uh, in, in audit of self-managed super funds. So now let's look at an example and I'm, I'm looking at a, a very complex uh, fund and it's a dentist super fund. He has some listed securities which he purchased in 2011. There's some, um, uh, the dentist um, uh, contributed to uh, property syndicates with his other dentist friends. So that's been going for some time. And there's a related trust that is a fixed unit trust which uh, owns his surgery. So I'm going to talk about that. I've got a slide for that. And there's some unpaid present entitlements from this trust. So this uh, un UPE is also an asset of the fund. Uh, it sits in receivables and it's an asset for the self-managed super fund. And then the, uh, the dentist purchased a unit in Auburn uh, some 10 years back in 2007. So if you go in as an auditor, you look at the listed securities and you say that uh, purchase price was 85 and 2015, 16, 17 went down and went up and all that. This You can't do much about it. So we're not going to talk much about this uh, side of things. You know, they're listed and whatever the correct valuation is, there would be some manual work to check whether the valuation has been correctly inserted in the financial statements, but that's about it. The second one is the property syndicate. As you can see in the financial statements, it is still sitting at cost price. And although the, the investment was made about three or four years back, and we're going to talk about what problems we will have in valuing uh, these kind of unlisted managed funds, or it could be unlisted shares as well. So the property syndicate could be in a unit trust structure or could be in a company structure. 
and then we'll talk about uh, related trust and um, uh, we invested 420,000 some in 2002 some many many years back and it is still sitting in the self-managed super fund accounts at cost price for a very long time and we're going to talk about with the issues with that and then the UPE figure has changed over the few years because the tenant of that uh, of that surgery is another related entity let's say it's a discretionary trust and it pays rent to the trust and i'm going to talk about that and if you look at the unit um, what you can see is that the dentist is trying to stay under the 1.6 million and although he has increased the value of the unit but it hasn't he hasn't increased it to the real market value uh, and uh, the way we are trying to figure that out as an auditor is because it was purchased about 10 years back and um, although there was no change in 2015 and 16 but there has been some change in 2017 but it's not substantial to reflect the current market value so let's look at each item one by one so the first is the unlisted security, the property syndicate, and the issues in valuation could be in getting the correct market value of this investment. And we don't know what the share value is or what the unit value is because there's no documentation provided by the syndicate. And usually these syndicates, what they do is they collect money from 20 people and then they buy an asset and then they have a a property manager who um, puts the DA through and then uh, get the unit block um, you know approved so let's say we go to build 20 units or some shops and then after the approval they go to a finance company and then you own the land more or less outright and then the finance company finances you and they use a marketing arm to sell those units and once the profit comes in it is distributed to the unit holders after paying interest to the bank now many a times what happens is the da is already approved so the market has or the market value of that asset has changed dramatically but it's not reflected in the unit trust or it's not reflected in the company and also if you try and contact these people you will need an authority from the trustees to get information from these people who try and who who run these syndicates so there could be some major major issues and it's quite possible that this value which you're going to disclose in the 2017 financial statements is probably at half or even lower value so you will have some challenges as an administrator and and as an auditor now the second situation is there's a related trust and it's a ungeared unit trust and just to go through this slowly so what the super fund did uh, the asset was which is the um, the surgery of the dentist you know the whole it could be a, a whole floor above certain shops it could be an office or some sort of a, it could even be a house so we're not interested in uh, that particular structure as such. We're just interested in how uh, the valuation of the related trust uh, could be, uh, you know, not reflected in the super fund accounts because the purchase was many years back, about 15 years back, but it is still sitting in the financial accounts of the self-managed super fund at still at the cost price. So the super fund invested in a related trust and it's a regulation 30 uh, sysreg 13.22 c trust where the super where the trust has not borrowed any money and uh, uh, it owns a business real property and the rent is paid to the related trust and there are other people who are related to the super fund who have invested in the trust so it could be the member personally also investing in the unit trust and it could be other entities maybe the tenant is a discretionary trust and the discretionary trust may have also invested so there could be various related entities or associates of the member of the fund who have invested in that related trust 
So the property was purchased for 840 and half the contributions came from the super fund and the issues in evaluation is that how far do we actually go as far as you as an auditor is concerned do we audit the fund as well and uh, do we audit this related trust as well i think you would because you would want to know who are the other unit holders and um, why the underlying property has not been revalued so that could be a major issue and you would also want to do a valuation and a title search on this property because it's possible that although at the time of purchase there was no uh, borrowing but later on it was refinanced and the related entities and the member were actually repaid so the audit uh, should actually extend to related trust as well and a title searches should be extended not only to the properties which are directly owned by the super fund but are also owned by related trust one way of checking uh, the market value could be the rent which is being paid and again you know uh, when you are dealing with uh, the super fund the market rent should be at arm's length section 109 of the sys act you should look at what's arm's length and this is arm's length because a property which is controlled by the super fund and you have a, a high interest and your substantial interest is in that unit trust so why the rent is not being paid i mean it's possible that this property could be worth uh, because it was purchased in 2002 this property worth could be 2 million and only 80000 dollars rent is being received so so it's possible that the rent which is being paid by the surgery uh, by the discretionary trust which runs the business may not be at market value and then there could be a contravention for section 109. Now, um, there are two issues here and they are to do with the depreciation and UPE issues and I'm gonna discuss them, but uh, let's talk about UPE. This is the unpaid present entitlement. So I've just extended um, our discussion here uh, that if the rent is $80,000 and then you know uh, we had UPE of certain figures. Now, as you can see in the first example, the unpaid present entitlement is actually increasing. And in the second situation, this is now I'm just going back up. So the rent comes from the discretionary trust into the related trust. And once the cash sits in the related trust and uh, that that related trust must distribute the income to the unit holders. And if it doesn't uh, distribute the income, then it is an unpaid present entitlement. So if the related trust doesn't pay uh, the income to the super fund and super fund uh, acknowledges or shows a receipt because if the rent is 80,000, uh, there could be some expenses and we're going to discuss that. So if the rent is 80,000, then 40,000 should be paid to the super fund. And if 40,000 is not paid to the super fund, if any less is paid, then the remainder of the 40,000, if 30,000 is paid, then 10,000 becomes the unpaid present entitlements. And trustees would, as we know, you know, they they would sometimes make a mistake or sometimes they don't know the law that this rent has to be paid in that proportion of the investment. Sometimes, and sometimes they need the money, so they withdraw more money. So if they withdraw more money themselves, or if they pay to this related entity, then there is not enough cash in the related trust to pay to the super fund. And if it is not paid to the super fund, there could be some issues. And the issues are that if the UP is not paid, then that asset, this asset becomes an in-house asset of the fund and if, if if the value of that in-house asset is more than four, more than five percent we all know what happens that we have to dismantle the trust that is sell the asset and that's the only solution uh, left and uh, you know you won't want a dentist to sell his surgery because that's where his goodwill lies but you will see that uh, in the second example or uh, or even in the first example that 
that there is some naughtiness happening here but actually there's nothing uh, naughty happening here and I've, I've shown you with an example uh, with with some calculations here so what we are looking at that upe was 6204 and then it went up so the rent was 80000 and the expenses for say example were 20000 rates or whatever land tax and all that so you're left with 60000 the ownership is 50% so we should have received uh, 30000 but we did not receive 30000 we received less and you can see the reason we received less so that means the 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 trust owes more money to the super fund but we received 27304 and the bifurcation of 27304 is the opening balance of upe is 6204 so we received so whatever we received out of that 27304 uh, the the upe of last year was actually received and the remainder is 21,100. So out of that 27,300, we should have received 30,000. We did not receive 8,900, which is the new EP, but we did receive 21,100. So 8,900 does not include the 6204. We have received 6204, but there is more money outstanding for 2016. So this is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And even the second one is fine because we received less but whatever we received we actually received this and in this year we actually received this amount so in 2017 we received the upe of 2016 and i don't know if you are aware or not uh, i was disqualified by asic because ato thought that i have not audited a fund correctly and the fund which i was auditing had the same situation that we had received the money, uh, but the unpaid uh, present entitlements were the same in three years. So my argument was that yes, we did receive the rent and a part of the money which we received was actually paying off the UPE in the beginning of the year. And then the remainder was the same amount. And then we fortunately or unfortunately had the still had the same amount which the trust owed to the super fund. So my statement is that there's actually nothing wrong in there. And um, those who have been following my case would know that when ASIC, um, you know, uh, determined that I didn't audit the fund properly, I had to take ASIC to the tribunal. And um, I'm probably one of those, I'm probably only one auditor who has won a case against ASIC. So I was registered back as, as a approved SMSF auditor. So uh, when you're auditing a fund, um, what's going to happen uh, is that uh, uh, if, you, if you're not careful, ATO will pick three funds. Now, speaking to another SMSF auditor, and he said that ASIC has told ATO that I want to reduce the number of auditors. So I want to uh, disqualify at least one per month. So can you find me someone who I can disqualify? And ATO is out there looking for auditors who are making mistakes. And the way they find you is that they look at the abnormalities reported by the, by the, uh, by the accountants who, uh, and they look at who has audited those funds. And they have allowed those funds to be, uh, to be, to be, uh, audited without a qualification uh, and whether uh, and and no contraventions were lodged by the auditor so you know if uh, if i was I'm, i don't audit funds anymore but if i was auditing funds uh, my percentage of lodging contravention report would be close to 30 to 40 percent and i have seen lots of um, um, you know skeletons out there which get uncovered and the reason they get uncovered i i believe is because uh, it's the same firm three or four or two partner firms hiding or sometimes uh, not knowing the legislation um, not uncovering uh, certain contraventions which lie inside the fund anyhow but that's a uh, I leave that for you to decide on whether you will be lodging contraventions on market values or not. 
The second issue is depreciation and depreciation uh, within that trust is very common. So I'm just going to go back and uh, just talk about depreciation. So when when the when the trust owns this asset, uh, it can claim because the rental is just the income. We might have strata or we might have council rights and land tax and other costs, but we could be also depreciating certain assets over here. So when we when we depreciate those assets, what actually happens is so within that trust structure, we may have cash expenses and we may have depreciation, which is non cash item. So the income of the trust is 80 minus 16 is 64. So because we have so much of cash sitting in the trust. So sometimes what happens is uh, sometimes uh, because 50 percent has to be paid out sometimes what the trustees do is they distribute the cash to the super fund and when they distribute the cash as you can see the share of income should be only 32,000 but because there is cash available in the fund and the reason the cash is available in the fund is because of a non cash item expense which is depreciation if 35000 in our example is paid out so basically it's a it's a uh, it's a related trust distributing a tax deferred distribution and and we all know when a super fund receives a tax deferred distribution it reduces the cost base and many funds i see who have related trust they actually do not reduce the cost base and that could be a major issue <coughs> for you now um what we could see is uh, some 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 uh, accountants what they do some administrators what they do so if the trust has received 80000 we may have cash expenses we have depreciation which is non cash the income of the trust is 64000 and half belongs to the super fund so they distribute $32000 but then there is cash because the cash which is received by the fund is 70000 so there is three thousand dollars which is sitting in the trust and that three thousand dollars actually belongs to the super fund and if it belongs to the super fund there are the uh, the uh, the three thousand dollars cash actually represents an asset of that trust so the trust owns two things the trust owns the dental surgery and it owns cash and because it owns cash what you're supposed to do is looking at the number of units issued you have to divide the assets by the units to find out the asset valuation so you must adjust the valuation so of course you know you have to look at the market value of the surgery but you should look at the other assets of the super fund now uh, i must ask you those who are not aware of section th of regulation 1322c those uh, trust cannot own anything else they can't own shares um, they must have only a bank account they cannot lend money to anyone else so the only asset which they will have is a bank account and that bank account is the asset of that trust and if that bank account is the asset of the trust it should increase your market value of that trust or the units which you hold in that trust and this is where we see there are problems okay now i'm on to the uh, last slide and this slide is to do uh, with the with the closing prices which the uh, which the trustee has used so in our example we said that he purchased the uh, the the dentist uh, the uh, dental surgery in 2007 some 10 years back um, <clears throat> we never looked at it and now he wants to make sure that he is within the balance transfer cap and he he increases the value but only slightly so which is again abnormal behavior by the trustee and if you look at this in some cases if you see anything like where the value has actually gone down so in 2015 uh, the value was still at cost because that is at purchase price but because of the uh, because of various reasons that is that that the trustee wants to come under the balance transfer cap he actually reduces the cost price um, and that that could be 
uh, a big problem because uh, these uh, valuations have been disclosed in the tax return. So if you see this kind of an activity, you must uh, must lodge a contravention because this could be really very dangerous. And of course, your license, your auditor's license could be on the line. But then you could see this sort of activity as well, which I again call it abnormal trustee valuation, where in the last two years it was at certain value. And then he's trying to maximize his balance transfer cap. OK, that if I go over 450, then if I'm on pension, you know, uh, I cannot uh, have a higher valuation because if I have a higher valuation, then I will have an accumulation account from 1st of July 2017. The correct way to do it is uh, the correct valuation would be on objective and supportive data and um, the uh, objective and supportive data because it's a unit in Auburn, it's in, it's in a block of flats. So you have comparative sales data and that that's close to the market value and obviously the result would be uh, if 650 is used and not 450 is used you will have 200,000 in the accumulation account of the member uh, that's it folks um, I've tried to explain uh, the complexities which you auditors and administrators face um, I've now come to question time um, my presentation is finished so those who are not interested can uh, log themselves out. But those who are interested to, or if you have a question, you can type it in in your panel. And uh, uh, I've got I've got about 20 odd question. I, I don't know whether I have the available time, but I'll just go through the various questions and see whether I can answer it now or whether I will need um, some more research work. So I've got a question from Richard. He says, in regard to valuation of real estate, let's say a fund purchases a property by arm's length auction on 20th of June. Um, sorry, I don't understand. Okay, so he's finishing up the question here. Um, so let's just, sorry, I'm going to read that question again. It says, in regard to valuation of real estate, let's say a fund purchases a property by arm's length auction on, 30th, on 20th of June. Clearly on 30th June, the auction price would be the market price. If stamp duty is paid before 30th of June, one would either expense the stamp duty rather than the traditional accounting of uh, capitalizing it or alternatively capitalizing the stamp duty and then immediately down valuing it. Do you concur? Richard, what I would do is that if I've taken, if I, if the super fund has bought a property on 20th of June, that means he settled it on 20th of June and he hasn't paid the stamp duty on the property because you get 90 days to pay the stamp duty. What I would do is I will add the stamp duty price to my cost price and I will show the stamp duty amount as sundry creditors on 30th of June. So the correct valuation would be is to include the stamp duty as the cost and show it as a liability because it is payable. So that's how I would prepare the accounts. Now, uh, I really doubt that there would be any change between 20th and 30th being it so close. But I would suggest that if you are auditor, if you're an auditor and if you see uh, that the asset was purchased in 2016, so let's say in December 2016 and you're auditing 2017 accounts. So the fund has owned the asset for six months. I think you should be requesting the adjustment to the market value. Uh, just to give you an example, uh, I my super fund purchased a property and after uh, exactly one year and two weeks, it was sold for almost 40% more. And then we bought uh, another property. This was between 2015 and 16. And then we bought another property end of 2016. And now we are in October. Uh, we are getting almost 30% more than what we paid for uh, less than 10 months back. And we are looking for buyers and then we would be selling as soon as the 12 months expire. So 
there has been a huge movement especially in the commercial air space in the last two years instead of in the residential space so uh, if you are an auditor you would be requesting changes if it is more than three months okay i have another question um a further question following from the hypothetical property purchased by public auction on 20th june assuming it was immediately re-auctioned one would expect it would sell for much the same price or at least the a bid of the underbidder uh, but the realized would be selling costs such as commission so should the newly purchased asset be revalued to the auction price less the selling cost um uh, it's a very good question now, because they will be selling cost um i would think that you know uh the market value as soon as you buy it let's say uh you know uh, uh, you buy the property and on 20th of june now you you have to value the property on 30th of june um there 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 will be a loss because you will have to engage um a selling agent to sell the property and there will be some selling costs so in my opinion if i see a set of accounts i'll be quite satisfied to see that because the selling price after costs would be the new market value because that is what the trustees would get now i think what you should do richard is just imagine um uh, the spread of buy and sell so you know when you have a uh, self managed super uh, sorry when you have uh, when you don't have a self managed super fund when you have a public offer fund there is um, there is a price um, uh, when you enter into the fund and there's a price when you come out of that fund so the selling cost is basically the difference between the entry and the exit price all right uh, i have precious mcdowell uh, saying can i have the notes emailed by email uh, sorry, I forgot uh, to mention. There's an email. Uh, I'm just going up to that page. Oh, here it is. Um, if you uh, if you look at uh, the email ID, um, yeah. If you email uh, this person, he has uh, a copy of these slides. It's r a m a n at trustd.com.au. So if you send him an email. Uh, he'll send you a copy of my slides my limitation here was is i'm allowed to only give you five handouts and i wanted to give you these word documents i could not upload my uh my presentation okay the next question i have is john from john thanks very serious consideration of valuation of assets carry for 1.6 million yeah so you know you should be very careful for the funds which have uh, members closer to 1.6 million because of the of the balance transfer cap more to do with with the cgt relief but cgt relief is a reason uh, why you know you should be very very careful in working out whether uh, the election has to be made in the tax return or not uh, one thing to note is uh, please uh, have a look at all your clients uh, uh, you know you should dial into your portal your tax agent portal and check what the lodgement date is because it is possible that for some funds the lodgement date is 31st of october and if you want to um, make an election uh, for a fund uh, which is uh, due date is 31st of october you might miss the boat because if you do it on the 1st of november you may not be able to make that election the next question is uh, sebastian it says to confirm did you say you had lodged ACR on 30 to 40 percent of your funds. Is this in the last year or in total appears to be well above the average? Yeah, Sebastian, what I said was that if I was auditing funds now, I'm I don't do audits anymore. Uh, but if I was to audit funds, I can give you an example. You know, I was asked by an accountant to audit his fund and um, his partner was auditing and he thought because of independent issues his partner cannot audit a fund and he said to me that it's a very clean fund manoj you won't have any problems you'll be in and out we'll have lunch while you're auditing the fund and that was going to be my fee when i looked at his fund um, uh, uh, 
he had uh, contributions from his member uh, from all the members and one of the members was his son and it had a corporate trustee and for some reason that uh, entity which was the trustee of the fund for some reason years back uh, the son was removed as a director of that corporate trustee so what i'm trying to highlight here is that the partner of the accounting firm i don't know whether he did an actual audit or not but he was signing off uh, audit reports for the last eight to ten years without checking whether all members are trustees uh, or all members are directors of the corporate trustee so the only solution we had was that uh, the son was removed as a director some eight or nine years back so we had to lodge a form 484 on the same day when he was removed and he had to pay something like two to three thousand dollars i don't remember the exact amount he was paid two or three thousand dollars as late lodgement fee for the form 484 because it was lodged nine years later so section 17a clearly says that all members of the fund must be directors of the corporate trustee and this small little fact was missed by the partner of the firm so what i'm saying is that um, i have uh, seen many 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 accounting firms where there are two partners or three partners or four partners and whenever i visited their offices uh, frankly i could not see any chinese walls i have never seen any chinese walls I have never seen that the auditor had nothing to do with the client. So there are lots of things, and and um, just imagine um, uh, the diversified SMSF uh, market out there. Um, there are many, many, many uh, two and three partner firms where the work is not outsourced, and this is what the tax office is also finding out now and they're going to um, change the rules and um, uh, the last time i looked at it you if you want to learn more about it you should look at the regulation uh, asic regulation 243.90 it talks about independence issues and what it does it it points to the independence issue the independence requirement of a smsf auditor um, are outlined in regulation 243 and uh, ASIC regulation 243 points to APS 110, the independence uh, guideline, which is issued by the three professional bodies, IPA, CPA, and CA. And if you look at the APS 110, you should look at clause 290. And um, in there, it's quite clearly outlined. And they talk about that there is a threat. Um, uh, and if you are not able to address that threat, uh, of familiarity between you know one uh, the one partner knowing the affairs of the other partner or the audit partner knowing what the other hand is doing you could be in a bit of strife so there are a lot of skeletons out there okay i have another question regarding the contravention report if i do not get engaged for non-compliance of the fund if i choose the fund before i get engaged i only take the quality I take the quality fund uh, then how ATO would measure my audit capability through contravention report um uh, no, but the the way I uh, understand the legislation if you have been engaged and uh, you, uh, the trustees has engaged you and you've issued an engagement letter and they have engaged you you have in your hand an engagement letter signed by the trustee you are the auditor of the fund and when you start auditing the fund, you find there are problems in the fund. And then you say, uh, I resign. Now, because you have resigned, does not mean that you don't have to lodge the contravention. Once you're engaged, even if you are fired or you resign, it doesn't matter, you still have to lodge a contravention report. Whether you get paid by the trustee or the administrator, that is a secondary issue. The primary issue out here is that if you find a contravention and where will you find that uh, uh, what i'm saying is in regulation 243 this is the guideline which ASIC has issued to all approved smsf auditors so once you're engaged you find something which is wrong in the fund 
you must contravene although your name may not be on the tax return so your job as a approved smsf auditor is to report in a contravention report okay i have another question uh with the property search you said that the three year rule doesn't apply anymore is it because of the 1.6 million cap uh the three year rule was there uh, a very long time back where insurance and superannuation commission used to be the regulator but since the ato has become the regulator and the uh it and the and ato has issued the valuation guidelines some two or three years back nowhere is there a mention of a 3 year valuation all they talk about is substantive data and uh, so the 3 year rule uh, does not apply anymore okay i have another question what about the funds that don't reach the cap okay so those uh, funds which uh, do not reach the balance transfer cap i'm assuming so let's say the fund uh assets are the member assets so there's only one member say for example and his balance is say 1.2 million right this member would be very encouraged to increase the market value from 1.2 million to 1.6 million if he increases the value of that asset to 1.6 million so later on if the asset 10 years later let's say it if it is sold for 1.7 the only tax which is to be paid is from 1.6 to 1.7 because he's got a cgt relief up to 1.6 whereas on 30th of june the correct market market valuation could be 1.2 so when the asset is ultimately sold for 10 years later from 1.2 to 1.7 the real gain is actually 500000 but because of the cgt claim uh, because of the cgt relief the tax is only 200000 so you should not assume that the balance transfer cap will be covered on later on so the market value which you are using could be for the other benefit that is to increase the uh, reset cost base of the property so that there are no capital gains tax to be paid look um, uh, if you don't have a very high uh, professional indemnity insurance and if you're auditing funds uh, with the um, uh, with property and you're not lodging contraventions i think uh, you'll be one of those which asic wants you know and asic would is looking for people who uh, or looking for auditors who have not looked at the valuation side of things very very carefully so you will be targeted so just be very very careful okay um without looking the fund i do not sign any engagement letter i think that's a very good idea um yeah uh, i would do that as well so i mean you should not issue uh, the engagement letter or you should not accept the assignment i mean you could be i mean that too two facts to it you can you can issue an uh, engagement letter and then there is a second letter you can write to say that i've looked at your fund and i've accepted your assignment it's because you're engaged does not mean that you will do the job an engagement letter is from the trustee to you but an acceptance letter is from the auditor to the trustee okay i've got time only for one more question and uh, i've got a uh, uh, gesture and um, the question is what about the funds that are already beyond the balance transfer cap total super balance would that mean that they cannot make any non concessional contributions anymore oh yes um, if your total super you're talking about total super balance so if you have reached 1.6 million i think um, just well you should be looking at the um, look at look at the legislation and the bring forward rules and you will notice that once you are have reached the balance transfer cap of 1.6 million no non concessional contributions are uh, allowed the last time you could have contributed was before 30th of june and there was a lot of media and even i did a presentation on contributions which is on the website you should look at that um and everybody knew that that was the only time they could uh, contribute that is before 30th of june and there was some um, interim transitional rule put in that is you could not contribute 
540 you could contribute only 380 and 300 i mean uh, i invite you to look at that uh, presentation which is on our website uh, thanks very much uh, for joining me and um, uh, you know the page uh, to go to to uh, register for uh, our next uh, webinar uh, like i said um, you know every two weeks we will be running a webinar and I'm trying to make the topics um, very, very, uh, uh, you know, useful, uh, uh, especially practical. And the next uh, 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 webinar is on running a pension in a super fund post 1st of July. And we'll be talking about how the balance transfer account goes up and down with pensions. And would you be thinking about merging pensions and recontribution strategies? and two super funds you know why trustees want them and what the tax office wants so i hope to catch up uh, with you guys uh, uh, on the 9th of november thank you bye for now